to the 19th century, Russian literary language was cumbersome and archaic until Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin arrives and changes everything. He's the greatest and most quoted national poet in Russia. I have to look at this, otherwise I forget what I'm saying. Pushkin adopted a uh, straightforward language which appealed to ordinary people and uh, implemented Western influences while retaining a literary style that was nonetheless unmistakably Russian. In today's Russian there's a uh, language celebration day which coincides with Pushkin's birthday, the 6th of June. Pushkin was born in 1799 into Moscow nobility. His maternal great-grandfather, Abram Petropovich Ganiba, was a military man which had been kind of adopted by the Tsar Peter the Great and, developed and undertook a brilliant military career at the court of the Tsar. Um, Pushkin must have been very proud of his maternal great-grandfather and his, for the times, very exotic background and wrote about him in a short novel, um, The Blackamoor of Peter the Great. Like all amazing geniuses, Pushkin was a complex man, a political rebel who kept getting into trouble with the Tsar and a provocatively liberal poet. He actually wrote a very blasphemous poem in which none other than the Virgin Mary gets serviced by the Archangel Gabriel, quite daring for the times, I dare say. And like his creation, Yevgeny Onegin, Pushkin was not an altogether likeable character, a bit of a liberty, nothing wrong with that. Also a debt-ridden gambler who liked to play with other people's money, prone to depression, to fits of incontrollable fury and forever challenging people to duels. Also proud of his unusually um, long and possibly dirty fingernails, which he must have flashed at countless beauties because he was very fond of sleeping with um, other people's wives and until, that is, someone threatened to sleep with his own. To be precise, his pest of the French brother-in-law, Dantes, and put an end to Pushkin's life when he was a mere 37, thus turning him instantly into the most tragic of tragic and romantic heroes. Yevgeny Onegin, one of Pushkin's masterpieces, is a novel in verse. There's an awful lot of reading and writing and letters in this novel. And right at the beginning of it, the uh, narrator, which we might take to be Pushkin himself, introduces us to the main character, a St. Petersburg dandy, waiting impatiently for his old uncle to die and leave him a lot of money. And he again is a thoughtless and selfish. He spends half his time getting dressed in the latest fashion from Europe and the other half being bored. We follow him around the busy city boulevards, enveloped in his beaver cup, frosted with silver snowflakes, as he goes from soiree to the opera to the theatre to ball, whatever, while enjoying none of it, played as he is by this relentless tedium. His old uncle finally dies, and Onyegin goes off to his landed estate. Will he find solace there in rural isolation? Will he enjoy the delightful cornfields and charming hamlets and the gentle peasants singing while harvesting berries? Actually, they weren't forced to sing while harvesting berries because if they sang, it meant they couldn't eat them, which is really not that charming at all. Um, will you be happy away from the glitzy but superficial world of cities lights, quietly sitting by the far side next to the samovar, listening to folk tales and discussing junk preserves with the local musics? What do you think? Within a couple of days he's sick of the country too. People are dull, life is slow. However, he meets young wannabe Byron. Vladimir Lensky and things begin to look up. The two enjoy each other's company. They frequent the Larins, a local family where there are two daughters. Young Lensky is madly in love with beautiful but uninteresting Olga. While Olga's sister, Tatiana, falls madly in love with Onegin. 
Tatiana is a contemplative young country girl who believes she truly loves Onyegin. And unable to sleep one night, she voices her desire for him and writes this beautiful letter full of passion and in which she discloses her animus feelings for Onyegin. For a while, she agonizes about what to do. Then she decides to give the letter to Onyegin and be damned. Onyegin reads the letter but dismisses Tatiana's passionate confession. He responds to her outpouring of emotions with cold formality. What were you thinking, bitch? I can't love you just because you love me. This ain't how I work. Tatiana is crushed. She swears that she will never love another man. And then, to make matters much worse, Anyegin dances with that silly goose, Olga. And Lienski gets all jealous and says, we are no longer friends, and challenges Onyegin to a pointless duel. Onyegin kills Lienski. Time passes and Onyegin is off travelling, Tatiana goes to Moscow, whatever. Um, they meet again and it's now Onyegin's turn to fall madly in love with Tatiana and she starts writing these beautiful letters to her so they kind of come full circle. It's too late. Tatiana is now married to a prince. She's a princess. She's in fact the queen of Moscow and St. Petersburg's high societies. Although she's world weary and she despises this kind of life, she just longs to go back to her village and the snow covered fir trees and lingon berries and you name it. Um, deep down, she still loves her maybe, but refuses to leave her husband. Onyegin is left humiliated and crushed, and some might say he serves him just right. Morally, Tatiana has made the right decision. This turned her instantly into some kind of ideal of uh, Russian womanhood, unlike, as we will see a few decades later, the fa fabulously tragic Madame Karenina, who will behave very differently. Russian literature is not famous for happy endings. So I'm going to sit Pushkin down and say, get the vodka out, Alexander Sergeyevich. I've got a better idea. So Onyegin seduces Olga, who just adds him to her long list of admirers, and then he just goes home and gets dressed to go to the next ball where she can dance in Zerka all night long. Onyegin goes off to um, battle and, and uh, has a military career and gets slightly less bored on the battlefield. Tatiana and Jan Lesky fall madly in love and go and live in the countryside and spend all of their time living happily ever after, writing love letters and reciting love poetry to each other. No one dies in a duel um, except for you in a few years' time. Sorry, talking about it.